Mike, you just wanted me to uh, point out, thought it was a good time to point out. We're, uh, as some of you may have noted in, in our advertisements, we're, we uh, perform at, uh, at uh, A432 or C256, which is a lower, slightly lower tuning, significantly though, uh, in effect. Um, from what uh, is uh, popular today, not just popular, but uh, uh, where an A would be at 440, or in, in uh, Berlin it might be A445, and so forth. And this this tuning up of the pitch um, uh, wrecks the human voice. Uh, it shortens the lifespan of, uh, of even a trained opera singer. Um, and we've uh, carried out a campaign over a few decades to. Um, pick up really where uh, Giuseppe Verdi left off, uh, the uh, great opera composer. He launched a campaign in Italy um, uh, for the lower tuning, uh, and, uh, and that was a century ago plus. Um, so uh, this is very important uh, because it, it actually helps uh, make the voices more transparent. Uh, if, you, if, you, if you remember tuning forks, uh, when you had your hearing tested, those tuning forks were at C256. Uh, you know, this is a, a physically determined uh, component of not just the singing voice, but the, the whole anatomy, uh, the human anatomy, and of, of nature more broadly. There's, it, it, there's a lot of other things that you could discover in the process. But uh, by tuning down to 256, suddenly the register shifts of the tenors or sopranos, altos, basses, um, fall into place. They fit the compositions because the composers, Bach through Brahms, composed at around C256, uh, not at these higher tunings, because they were, in part, they were all choral singers themselves. They grew up singing. Um, and, it, uh, and the idea of, of tuning up pitches uh, to make instruments brighter and forgetting about the human element is part of the arbitrariness of what's come into culture in a lot of ways. Uh, so we're addressing this um, as, as a, a substantive issue. Uh, it goes to this question of, of, of a coherence between uh, science and music um, and uh, with, with uh, measurable results, beautiful results. So uh, hopefully that'll be a little, you'll see a sense of that in the um, in the performances tonight. Okay. So I was uh, quoting, as it, as many of you know, Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, my name is Brian Lance. I'm here on behalf of the Scheller Institute, and we're happy all of you were able to come out tonight uh, for this event, which is a community event. It's here at Tracy G Community Center for a reason. We're taking uh, great music, uh, and we're taking it out to the communities, but we're also ourselves uh, developing a chorus, a community chorus. Uh, music is not something to be treated at, you know, arms, at arm's length, but it's something to, to uh, actually uh, uh, take in uh, to your heart and, uh, and, uh, and as a consequence shape your, your thinking and, and, and your direction and your spirit. Um, uh, I, I just want to start with a, a few weird words by means of introduction here. Uh, we're celebrating, of course, the birthday, which was April 15th, of the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. January. I'm sorry? What did I say? January. January. Yeah. Excuse me, whatever I said. I'm already leaping ahead of my... Um, and, um, uh, and he passed away April 4th in 1968, uh, tragically. Uh, at only 39 years of age, uh, which is uh, something to uh, seriously ponder uh, in terms of both what he accomplished uh, in his lifetime, um, but what is left to, to be done. Um, uh, the the, the uh, theme for our, our um, celebration tonight, uh, taken from the I Have a Dream speech, uh, given there at the Lincoln Memorial in 1963, to transform the jangled discords of our nation into a symphony of brotherhood uh, as the intention. And um, 
and that 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 makes sense in more ways than one, as any beautiful metaphor does. Uh, King himself was uh, completely uh, immersed in music, not just in terms of the music of the church, of the Baptist church, but throughout his life. I just want to refer to a, a, a few, a, a sampling of that um, as a way of kind of opening up the, uh, the, the presentation tonight. Um, first of all, I want to read from, uh, from Martin Luther King Jr.'s autobiography. Uh, it's, it's from chapter six. It's just a single really a part of a paragraph. Um, it's written, well you'll see when it's written, he's in his 20s, he's just finishing his PhD work. He hasn't finished that yet. He's been married now to Coretta Scott uh, for uh, about a year uh, and he's now starting to look for work and he's, he's he has offers in New York, he has offers in Boston and so on and so forth, but he's heading south. Um, uh, and the chapter is titled Dexter Avenue Baptist Church. Um, on a cool Saturday morning in January 1954, I set out to drive from Atlanta, Georgia to Montgomery, Alabama. It was one of those clear, wintry days when the sun bedecked the skies with all of its radiant beauty. After starting out on the highway, I happened to turn on the radio. Fortunately, the Metropolitan Opera was on the air with the performance of one of my favorite operas, Donizetti's Lucia de Lammermoor. So, with a captivating beauty of the countryside, the inspiration of Donizetti's inimitable music, and the matchless splendor of the skies, the usual monotony that accompanies a a drive, especially when one is alone, was absorbed into meaningful diversions. Uh, and that's a little bit, uh, maybe a side of uh, Martin Luther King you, you, uh, you don't think of, but maybe it's something you're familiar with, but I think it's worth recalling um, today. Um, secondly, I wanted to uh, just mention a little bit about Coretta Scott. Coretta Scott King, his, his uh, wife, of course, well-known wife, but just briefly, um, uh, they met in Boston while he was at Boston University working on his uh, degree, PhD, um, and she was at the New England Conservatory of Music uh, studying voice and, uh, and violin and also uh, played the piano. Uh, she was training under Marie Sundelius. Uh, a classical, uh, classically trained soprano who performed for decades at the Metropolitan Opera, uh, then returned to her native Sweden and performed there at the Royal Swedish Opera and then came back to Boston to, to uh, teach at the New England Conservatory of Music. So this was, this is Coretta Scott, Scott King's teacher and she was training as a classical uh, singer. Um, um, uh, also, I would just add later on, I mean, uh, you'll, if you look, you'll find pictures of her with the children in front of the piano at home and so forth. This is, this is part of the life um, uh, uh, that they had um, uh, during the Civil Rights Movement and then following uh, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King's tragic death, she organized a continuing series of what she called Freedom Concerts which combined poetry, prose, and music uh, to teach the history of the Civil Rights Movement. Uh, and in some sense, uh, some humble sense, uh, that's what we're doing here uh, and, and want to uh, uh, spread. Um, so uh, I think with those notes, one, one final note, we're going to hear uh, in a, just a, a, a few minutes, we're going to hear um, a, um, a piece of Ave Maria by Schubert. Um, and I would just point out that, uh, of course, Marian Anderson made this famous in her performance uh, before the Lincoln Memorial, uh, but uh, in, in the Easter Sunday of 1939. But uh, uh, Martin Luther King speaks of, uh, spoke on this at length and was deeply moved by uh, her uh, autobiography, uh, 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 My Lord, What a Beautiful Morning itself a, a 
well known spiritual. <laughs> uh, um, and so we'll be we'll be hearing that song in a few minutes. But Marian Anderson, a, a, another influence um, on the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, now, finally, I just want to turn quickly here to to the um, the Alabama, uh, Albany campaign, Georgia, in 1961-62, um, with the arrival of. Uh, Organizers, two organizers from SNCC, um, uh, Cordell Regon and Charles Scher Sherrod, uh, who arrived in November 1st of 1961. And they started uh, workshops there in Albany. Um, and uh, Regon immediately identified two gifted singers, Rutha Harris and Bernice Johnson, who were both studying uh, in the tradition of Marian Anderson to become opera singers. Um, and so by pre-arrangement, having worked on a number of songs, um, when it came the, to a meeting, the first mass meeting in Albany, called when two other students were arrested, um, uh, leaving for Christmas break, uh, for refusing to uh, honor the colored uh, divisions you know, of the, uh, in the uh, bus depot. Um, um, uh, the, this group stepped forth of, of singers, stepped forth by prearrangement. No one played the piano. I'm reading from uh, Parting of the Waters by uh, Taylor Branch. By prearrangement, no one played the pianos or organs for either the freedom songs or the church hymns. The harmonies and intensities of naked voices became a trademark of the Albany movement. The songs hark back to the moods of the slavery spirituals. There were tragic, sweet songs like Oh Freedom and rollicking ones like This Little Light of Mine. Their a cappella singing <coughs> took the service away from the control of either the preachers or the organists. The spirit of the songs could sweep up the crowd and so forth. Now into this situation stepped the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King uh, a month later. And, uh, uh, and people gathered at the churches there. I'll, I'll skip over details, but the, he came in and they were singing, uh, they had set the, a, a freedom chant to the tune of Amen. Uh, and uh, as, they, as he entered the church, the, the church exploded in this uh, uh, singing of Martin King says freedom. Martin King says freedom. Freedom, freedom, Martin Luther. Martin King, Martin King says freedom. Um, and, uh, and then Rutha Harris took this up as, as a soloist. And as King began to stop to, to speak, a, uh, a bass in the audience began responding to his questions, shouting out, God Almighty. Uh, and, uh, and King said, the old man's cries kept punctuating King's rising voice, how long, not long litany, and Waters lost ground in his desperate efforts to jot down each word. This was the reporter. King was soaring now as he spoke of redemptive suffering, the possibility of martyrdom. Uh, but we shall overcome, he cried, and both churches shouted back, there was two churches involved, shall overcome. And he's the song of that title sprouted softly here and there beneath his oratory, uh, oratorical descent. Don't stop now, King admonished them. Keep moving. Walk together, children. Don't you get word. There's a great camp meeting. Suddenly, without the usual cries of jubilation from a hymn or a prophet, his voice trailed off. And the audience began, the congregation, to sing, We Shall Overcome. Uh, and this was uh, really one of the inception, or one of the kind of birth points for the, uh, the role of the spirituals and the, and the freedom songs, which then came to be so famously associated with the movement. Um, what, uh, what Sherrod and Rigon had discovered was that, as they put it, people could be brought to sing ideas that they would not speak, that they were fearful of speaking. And they found courage through the song. So I'll leave it with that, and uh, we'll take up some songs. <laughs>